uh, towards the end of medical school, uh, my father passed away about six months before graduating. Uh, I had planned, uh, after completing internship, to kind of leave medicine entirely to do art. And during that time, one of the projects that I wanted to undertake was to delve into my family history. Now, I felt a tremendous loss. Now, of course, my father passing away was a loss, but I never had a chance to sit down and talk to him about his past experiences, what happened to him during the war, uh, and how he established himself in Canada and then the United States. And, and that was gone. Uh, so I thought that, well, one way to, to make amends here and to fill in the gaps in my knowledge was to interview my uh, uh, living relatives and document as much mater material as I could about them and about the family and the family history and family trees and genealogy. So I started that in 1976 with interviews of my uncle uh, Valentin Aspropis in Rockford, Illinois, and then Albin Aspropis in Toronto, and uh, expanded. I was living in Washington, D.C. then and uh, hit the Library of Congress for reference material. And, and, and over the next two years, I pulled together all the material that I could find about Propli, including family trees, my own publications, everything, and, uh, and pulled together this one volume. And this is it, including the family trees, the genealogy, and the documentary material published by Propli. So that was 1979, what, 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 it, what the Propli uh, material looked like. And since then, uh, if one wanted to do a similar kind of thing, collect everything together, that would be totally impossible. Um, my own neurology, neurobiology research results pub add up three separate volumes right here. Uh, the work that I did with the Hope and Spirit Project commemorating the uh, victims of Stalin's uh, atrocities, one entire volume here. My art, this is just the beginnings of the art, another volume. The, I published a book uh, my research about Chirlionis, one book here. The, my sister Ramute uh, wrote two books. Uh, she translated another one. And my aunt, Odona Propliene, translated uh, from German into Lithuanian uh, a, a novel. And that's what's published. So uh, uh, that's just the beginning of things. Much more material could be added. So that uh, to be comprehensive is not possible. Uh, but over the past uh, two, two, three decades, I thought it, I, I really want to expand this effort of collecting information uh, from my relatives because my uncles both passed away and I, I had that information from them, but there were many people in Lithuania. So I, I employed my sister Ramuta to travel to Lithuania, interview people, and she then uh, transcribed all of the recordings that she made and translated them uh, from Lithuanian into English. And so now, I've redone, and instead of one small volume, we have now the Propliste de History, a three-volume set. Um, the first volume includes a lot of the documented, there's no articles, reprints, or anything like that in, in this material. This deals with the origins of the Propliste first name, and then the genealogies, uh, the, the, fa the family trees that, it, that we have uh, from many different sources. And the second volume, deals primarily with rem the reminiscences of uh, particularly the World War I, World War II of, uh, of all of my uh, relatives that I'm with to transcribe and translate it. There's a lot of valuable information in these books and that was documented and, and exists. The, the books themselves, uh, I'll be discussing just a small aspect of the origin of the Propliste name, origin of the Propliste lineage uh, later in this presentation today. The, um, the, origin, the full books volumes are available in several different places in the world. In Chicago, there are a set of these books is at the Bozakas Museum of Lithuanian Culture. They're at the Lithuanian Research and Study Center as part of my archives. And they will also be when the pandemic's over in the Newberry Library, so they'll be available there. They're available at, in Salt Lake City at the largest genealogical research center in the world, uh, run by the Mormons. Uh, in Lithuania, uh, also the United States and the Library of Congress. The full set of books are available there for the public to review. And in Lithuania, in, in uh, Martinus Majvidas Library, there's a set of them, and in Kaunas, uh, uh, in the Institute for Diaspora Studies at Vytautas Magnus University, there's a set of these things available there. And so that, so that the original materials can be obtained. Also, digital versions of this are available in many other source uh, locations. Uh, 
Uh, the Pliotis uh, surname is uncommon in Lithuania. And in my experience over the past 45 years in talking to different uh, Pliotle, uh, when they go back in their family histories, it always ends up in a small same corner, southwest corner of Lithuania, the or origins take place, which is what I'll be talking about today. And it's been sort of satisfying that when people over the years have reached out to me, uh, one person, uh, Gilda Pliotis from uh, Buenos Aires, Argentina, with her brother Rodolfo, and she sent me information about her family, and they connect up with my family tree per perfectly. Uh, her, her grandfather, Justinas Pliotis, uh, moved uh, to Buenos Aires in 1928. There's a, a similar family that moved to uh, Sao Paulo in Brazil. And one of the grandkids uh, is uh, teaching at the University of Nebraska, who reached out to me, also connects up on the family tree. Uh, not everyone connects up on the family trees that I've pulled together, because it only goes back so far, and the Pliotis surname goes back uh, probably over 500 years. And uh, for example, in Scotland, in Glasgow, Scotland, there's only a of Pliotle up there, which I've not been able to connect up. And uh, their early immigration is to Chicago and to the United States took place and I have that information up in my volumes about th those lineages and those don't seem to connect up. I think if you only went far enough back, they would connect up. So I, I think in essence, if you're a Pliotis, we're all interrelated in, in some fashion. Uh, it may be very distant cousins, but we're all related. Now, I'm just starting with the first image is the uh, picture of my father. Uh, right at the end of the war when he uh, emigrated to uh, uh, Canada. The, I grew up in Toronto, Canada, my sister La uh, uh, with my parents. Uh, she suffered polio in the last pandemic uh, that went through North America. And what you can't see is my father is actually holding her up. She wasn't able to stand. And she had a lot of weakness for her entire life in her lower extremities. And then the following winter, uh, she's wearing braces on her legs so she'd be able to stand. Uh, I think that's one of the reasons I went into neurology, having grown up with a, gr uh, with a sister who had a neurologic uh, lifelong disability. Now this is a photograph in Lithuania. My father's in the center. To his right is his brother, Dennis Pliotis, and to the left is Valentinas Pliotis. Uh, the three brothers grew up on the, in the Pliotis village. Uh, after the war, my, um, uh, during, the, during independent uh, Lithuania days, my Uncle Valentinas Pliotis uh, graduated medical school. He was a physician. And uh, then after the war in displaced person camps in, in Germany, he was uh, worked as a doctor and eventually settled in Rockford, Illinois. The, my uh, uncle Aldenas joined the Lithuanian cavalry and eventually after the war ended up in uh, Czechoslovakia and then emigrated uh, to Canada. The, and this is my father. Uh, he's dressed uh, in a police uniform of a border patrol guard. Now, since the Pliotis village is only some 20 kilometers from the Prussian border, I presume that this is where he was stationed and where he worked. And this is him on duty, uh, uh, being a, a border a a, a, a policeman. Uh, he likewise ended up uh, in the DP camps and then eventually settled in Toronto, uh, where Albenas, his brother, uh, lived. This is the house where my father and, and um, uh, and both uncles were born and raised in the Pliotis village. I took this photograph just uh, uh, two months ago when I visited Lithuania. This is the way the house looked, looks like in uh, uh, photographs that were taken in the 1920s. The entire Pliotis village was totally destroyed, destroyed, all the buildings totally destroyed in World War I. And everything that's been built since then uh, is post-World War I in vintage. And this was built probably around 1920. And it's still there and uh, functioning as a house for families uh, quite well. Looking, this is Mateus Pliotis' house. If you simply turn around and look the opposite direction, what you see is the uh, Pliotis uh, Cemetery, which was built on his land. This was built in the 1930s, and, and Pliotis and other family members are buried there including my grandfather, Mateus Pliotis. And uh, here's the photograph uh, uh, that's on his uh, tombstone. Uh, his wife, Ona Pliotis, uh, working the farm, and, and then when she was deported to Siberia. Now she was assigned at the tender young age of her late 60s to be a lumberjack um, uh, up in Siberia, and somehow she was able to survive the eight years of deportation. 
Uh, Twelve of my blood relatives were deported to Siberia. Seven of them were able to return. The others died there. And four of my blood relatives, including my two grandfathers, were killed during N uh, the uh, NKVD interrogations or as a consequence of them. Uh, so there was a, a, a lot of suffering took place at the hands of the, uh, the new regime post-World War II. Now, when I started looking at the background history of my family, I, I didn't want to simply look at through a piece. I wanted to look at all of my four bears, both on my father's side and on my mother's side. And if you ever undertake something like that, you'll find a large number of other surnames uh, that, that exist that uh, are, 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 are significant in, in your own lineage. Uh, I was in uh, Washington, D.C. at the time, access to all the resources of the Library of Congress. And when I started my work uh, looking for research on background information, I looked through all of these names, surnames. The only one that went back in time that I could find anything about was Priopis. Everything else just didn't go back. So it's sort of just fortunate that that worked out that way. And then, as I mentioned before, I hired my sister, Ramuta, uh, to work for me to collect further uh, genealogic information and uh, memoirs of, 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 of uh, close family relatives and friends. The first thing I want to get into is what is the meaning of the Pleopolis surname? Uh, the Pleopolis surname was in existence in 1561 and probably developed at least 100 years earlier, uh, uh, maybe uh, quite a bit more than that. So it's been around for more than 500 years. Looking at the meaning of it, it's, it's, it's incorrect to look simply at the most current Lithuanian usage of words. Uh, uh, you're missing out on the background history and background information of what occurred back then. And the Pleopli surname arose in a geographic location right next to Prussia, probably in Prussia itself, where there were a number of other very big influences. One thing was the, uh, in that area, was the old Prussian language, a Baltic language that is, past, uh, that is no longer in existence. There's also the Otvingian language, another Baltic language in that area, which had influences. And, and then above all, uh, German from the Teutonic Knights, probably a very heavy German influence um, in the origin of the Propis surnames. One has to take all of these things into account and look at some of the oldest and most thorough uh, linguistic sources in looking at what is the meaning of the uh, surname. Now, surnames only started to appear in that geographic area in the early 1400s. Um, uh, pre I presume one, one fact was population growth, important to be able to identify who's who, just one simple name wasn't enough. If you think back to Lithuanian history, the original rulers, it was Vytautas, Gediminas, Mendogas, it was one word, all this all was necessary. You didn't need to have a, a name and a surname. But then as the population grow, grew, you needed to have somewhat distinguished individuals, particularly in relation to taxes that needed to be paid for governmental purposes. Also, in the early 1400s, Lithuania was being Christianized, and then there was the movement that your first name had to be a Christian name, and your last name could be, uh, you know, maintain this pagan origins. So that, that was another major reason for the, why surnames and, and first names uh, developed. Now, in 1561, there already were eight different Propis families in, 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 in the Verbatis area. Um, and, and presumably, since you have eight families, they came from, from, from Prussia, I think. And, and so you probably, the origin of the surname comes back into the mid-early 1400s, uh, more than 500 years ago. And you have to look at the origins. And I think when you look at the um, uh, sources, the, the most reliable, uh, linguistic sources, the meaning comes out to be the sound, it's a hydronym related to the sound of a water, the sound of a r heavy rainstorm or the sound of a roaring river. That's what Prepis uh, kind of o o o originates from. And I'll just give you some uh, uh, references here. In 1921, Princeton University Press printed the Lithuanian e Etymological Index. And under Propis, when you look at it, there's three possible definitions. Again, you here you see again the kind of German uh, uh, background uh, to, to the origins that are being looked at uh, quite correctly, quite appropriately. And uh, the first Plaschern uh, stands for lapping water. The it's a hydronym, the sound of water. Uh, uh, and the second, Rauschen, the sound of rushing water. And it's only the third one, the last one, to talk, to talk excessively. Um, uh, so, so that... Uh, uh, the first two main reasons are, are the hydronym. 
But that's the Princeton University Press. The biggest data collection of Lithuanian etymology was collected by Kazimierz Buga. Uh, that was his lifelong passion. He passed away in 1924. And after his death, his work was continued in independent Lithuania and then in Soviet Lithuania uh, the, the, to collect as much information across, going back in time across the country as much as possible. And it's a very large two-volume book published in 1959, uh, based mostly on the work that he did himself, but then supplemented by a lot of other researchers. And if you look there for the uh, for Pure Please, uh, you have five entries here, all hydronyms, four of which have kind of a, 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 ger a German uh, accent to it. Uh, uh, to flow, Churchlutekirte and Lithuania mean the sounds of, 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 of rushing water. To gush, the sound of gushing water, the sound of boiling water, the sound of things being wetted. So you have five different hydronym explanations for the definition of the, uh, of the word pro peace. And only then, later on in the book, does the thing to talk show up. Uh, and so that you have now five hydronyms to, to just one talk. So I think, I think it's pretty solid based on the fact that Kazimierz's Buga work is the definitive uh, li uh, linguistic source of etymology in Lithuanian language. I think, I think it's pretty solid that uh, pro peace surname is a hydronym, as I explained. When you look further then, uh, already 1972, you have uh, in, in, in the dictionary of Lithuanian language, the first entry is to talk too much, and then you have the two hydronyms, uh, the one of a strong uh, sound of a storm and the sound of, of, of a river, a uh, roaring river. The, and then later on, Become, things become simpler, more condensed, and, and, and then you'll end up with the more common usage, contemporary, of, of to talk too much. The, that, that's contemporary Lithuanian. That's not the way it originated 500 plus years ago. Uh, so, uh, so, so that the Propis is actually a hydronym with German influence behind it, re meaning the sound of a storm, rainstorm, the sound of a roaring river. Now, uh, the Verbalist Inventory was pulled together in 1561. Um, it was published in 1934 by Jablonskis uh, in Lithuania as part of Lithuanian archives, historical archives. I don't recall how it was who told me to look in this source material, but when I heard about it, I started looking. The Library of Congress did not have a copy of this thing. I started writing to sources across the, uh, internationally to see if I could get a copy of it. And it was actually Aniseta Simutis, who was the Consul General of Lithuania, the independent Lithuania, not Soviet Lithuania, in New York City, who had it in the archives there. And so in 1977, he was kind enough to make photocopies of the Verbalis Inventory and sent them to me. The, uh, it was pulled together on October, finalized on October 12th of 1561. And when uh, you looked at it, these are now just little segments of it, the proplay stood out immediately. Uh, now this is written in, in the ancient form of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, Polish language with lots of errors in it. So you don't expect things to be uh, and written in, in Polish and not in the original Lithuanian. So you don't expect the word proplis to show up in the correct spelling. You expect it to be presented in a different fashion. And here already you have Rimpus Propi, Tilanus Propi, Thomas Propi, Jonas Propi, a whole series of Propi uh, listed in there. Now, the story of the, in the inventory itself is a very interesting one. The background story of it is very interesting. It starts off with a woman by the name of Bona Svorza, who was born in Milan uh, of a very wealthy family. And here are, are several portraits of her uh, that were done uh, early in her life all in a beautiful Renaissance style, uh, even a sort of a flavor of, uh, uh, of Leonardo da Vinci here. Her father was the rightful ruler of the city of Milan. However, he was deposed by Ludvico Sforza, her uncle, and actually put to death. So there was no friendship between Bona and Ludvico, even though she still lived in Milan and he was the ruler of Milan. Now, Ludvico plays an extremely important role in the history of art, one of the most important roles. He was the first benefactor 
and the primary benefactor for the development of the career and, this, and, his, and, and his assistance lasted for almost 20 years of Leonardo da Vinci. And so that's how Ludovico puts his name in as a prime, as a big name in the history of art. And because of Ludovico and all his days in, in Milan, Leonardo da Vinci did what I consider his two most important oil paintings, the two versions of the Virgin of the Rocks and the, the large uh, uh, work of uh, the uh, Last Supper, which is currently still on display in Milan. So, so there's a kind of connection there to the Sforza family of the high, high Renaissance. This is the ruler of Lithuania at that time. He was the Grand Duke Gigimantas. And in 1517, he married uh, Bona, and she moved to Lithuania. As part of the dowry that he gave her was a tract of land. And on the map of Lithuania, current map of Lithuania, uh, if you look at it, uh, from the city Mariampola just to the west along the Prussian border, there's a strip of land uh, going up, and this is a little bit closer view of it, from Virbalis, which is indicated going straight up to the top of the center of the slide, to Yurbarkas. That strip of land along the Prussian border was given to Bona in 1517 for her for personal use and to do whatever she wanted to with it. And so that's the origins of how that inventory ultimately showed up. Now, she established Verbales and it appears that it's the only city that she actually established in her territory in 1539. There's historical sources that there was already a city there about 10 years earlier, so it wasn't, so she sort of was building on, uh, 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 on this uh, existing area. As it turns out, it was a very important role for commerce, for trade, uh, as a trade route. So she wanted to sort of uh, develop this area. What she did is she gave away land to people who would come and settle there, and they would become free landowners. She, being from the Renaissance of Italy, high Renaissance of Italy, hated the idea of serfdom. Serfdom was just a scratch above slavery and she didn't want to have anything to do with it. The land, she gave it away for people to be free landowners. Uh, and in return, they would pay taxes, just like in North America. I own this house where I, I'm talking from, and I pay taxes. I'm the owner, but I pay taxes to the government. That's the way she established it. And for the first uh, two or three years, you didn't have to pay any taxes because you're establishing a farm, you're getting building your housing. Uh, but after that, you had to pay, pay the set rate of taxation. And she did very well financially from this kind of an investment that she did. Mind you, serfdom was only eliminated in Lithuania in 1861, more than 300 years later. So that to be a free landowner in Lithuania was a real mark of distinction. It's somebody totally, totally different. The Proplé were right from the first days of free landowners, which made it very distinction. I don't see any glory in being a serf or being a slave. I likewise don't see any glory in being a wealth, wealthy person who owns serfs or slaves. I, I don't see any glory in that. But there is glory in being an independent landowner. And that came down, at least, at least in my upbringing, that's my father. That's the definition of my father. He had to set up his own business. He had to be independent. He couldn't stand working for other people. That's in me too. I had to be independent. And, and, and it seems to be running through a large number of the police people that I personally know closely and my cousins. Now, the Proplé would have settled in Verbales before 1561 since none, none of them had to um, pay ta uh, were exempt for taxes in the document. So somewhere between 1540 to 1558 they settled and they were free landowners. And eventually, um, a, a portion from, from uh, Verbales moved to the uh, Proplis village, which is about 36 kilometers away, and settled there. And according to Albinas Proplis' recollections, which went back by, you know, by uh, 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 tales from relatives, went back to the mid-1700s of being in that location, always being free landowners, never being serfs. Now we have another, uh, the son of uh, Ona uh, uh, Schwarza is Jigimantas Augustus. When his father died, he became the Grand Duke of Lithuania. Uh, he fell in love 
with Barbara Radvalaite and clandestinely got married. And his mother, Anna, was absolutely furious about this, very upset. She, Anna considered her to be a commoner. She was not of the high upper class Italian that she expected for her son. And this is a portrait of her, uh, uh, Barbara uh, dying, and, it's presumed, and, and there's some suspicion that, uh, 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 that um, she was poisoned uh, by her mother-in-law and died there. In fury, uh, despite even with her death in 1556, she packed up her bags and moved back to Italy, uh, where she died a year later. And it's said that when she moved, she had 24 carriages loaded down with her jewelry and other precious items. She was extremely wealthy. Now, the other person that plays into this story is Albrecht, Grand Duke Albrecht, the, the, the Grand Duke of Prussia. He previously had been the leader of the German Teutonic Knights, the Crusaders, uh, uh, up in Prussia and, and, and that area. Um, Martin Luther uh, declared uh, his theses in 1517 the big schism took place with the uh, Roman Church a few years later. And by 1522, uh, Albrecht was enamored with Luther, Luther's teaching and considered himself to be Lutheran. In 1525, he established the Prussian uh, Duchy and declared himself the uh, uh, Grand Duke of, of Prussia uh, with the agreement of the uh, neighboring uh, Polish state. And he immediately declared R Lutheran to be the official religion of Prussia. This was the first Protestant country in the world. Um, and it was a very open approach, a very, very sensible approach to the way religion was, was practiced and very intelligent. Uh, just five years later, in 1530, in the city of Tilge, the, all the church services were in Lithuanian because the large Lithuanian community there, Lithuanian language was there, uh, was, was, was encouraged. He, uh, a Lithuanian university, Karlauchis University, was established in 1544 uh, in, in Prussia. This is 35 years before Vilnius University was established. And, and uh, Albrecht heard about Martinus Majvidas and other people and attracted them to come uh, to live in Prussia uh, as being very bright, intelligent Lithuanians who could then expand the Lutheran religion into Lithuanian territories. Now, Gigimantas Augustus, the ruler of Lithuania at that time, ran into financial difficulties. And he approached Duke Albrecht for a loan of $30,000, which is approximately now what would be valued about 50 million US dollars. And in exchange, what he put up was the, the tract of land that his mother received uh, as a dowry, Verbalis Jorbarkas, up as collateral with the idea that uh, the Duke uh, Albrecht would be able to kind of be kind of local sovereign and receive all the taxes uh, from the people living there, as opposed to, uh, and, and then uh, when the debt would be paid back, the prop, the, all the land would become back to the ownership of the um, uh, of Lithuanian uh, government. So basically for eight years, the de facto ruler of this tract of land was Prince Albrecht, uh, who was Lutheran. And this is now, uh, I repeat the same image I showed you before, the geographical equation, Virbalis and the Yorubarka straight north of it, the tract of land there. And the other story, cities that play a the big role in is the, the Plyptis village, where a portion of the Plyptis eventually moved to, which is about 36 kilometers away. Shirventas, which is in Prussia, a city about 16 kilometers away. And, and Ragaina, which is about uh, 68 kilometers away, all fairly close uh, 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 in geographic location. And getting back to the actual um, uh, inventory, when you look at the way it's published and written here, you have listings of property uh, and it, there's an orientation to each group in terms of the when you're walking there from the first, second, third lot of land, who owns it, the name is written down there with some explanation as to where it's located. The, and, and in the larger paragraph areas here, it's explaining what streets it's on, what intersections it's there, so that one could then easily locate the exact locations of, of the land tracks that are being uh, uh, identified. Okay, there were four different uh, lots of land, the different taxation rates. City plots 
which were peaceful residences where they had their houses, where they lived. And then city gardens, city pastures, and then the large vallate, which were large farms in forested areas. Uh, the city uh, uh, gardens and pastures were uh, 0.7 hectares in size, which is almost two acres in size. And the vallate, the farmland and forest tracts were 21 hectares or 53 acres in size, rather large areas of land. To me, besides the Proplet, which is really what I was looking for uh, on this slide, there's something else stood out, which really sort of stunned me. And that look where the number 15 is, you see the word, Polish word for, is priest, Thomas, and priest Martinas from Ra Ragaine. These are references to Martinas Majvidas. Uh, the, and here you see it a little bit more, um, a priest, the first line, the priest Marta, uh, Mar Martinus Majudas from Ragaina. And it was well known that he w was the Lutheran priest in the city of Ragaina. That was his primary job at that time. And again, he has multiple different tracts of land uh, present. But, not, but it's not only him, but there's also another priest, uh, Thomas Gedgantas from Shirventas. And he shows up, he's been identified here. So, and Shirventas, as I showed you where Ragain and Shirventas is, they're all fairly close to Verbalis. And uh, Gedgantas was in charge of the Lutheran parish in Shirventas, Majvidas and Ragaina, but they had multiple lot, lots of land in uh, um, uh, Verbalis. And so therefore they had double residences. And given the closeness, it wasn't any problem for them to travel between one and the other and, and take care of both parishes. The fact that they were in Verbalis and actively uh, 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 as Lutheran ministers was something totally that sort of surprised me and shocked me. And they're right next to the Ploplé, intermingled with them, which to me was very surprising. Now, Martinus Majvidas is an extremely important person in Lithuanian history. He was not, not only the father of the Protestant Reformation in Lithuania, but uh, he published the first book in the Lithuanian language, a catechism. Uh, there's only two original copies left, one of which is uh, at the University of Vilnius, and it's on, uh, on display here, a photograph of it. The other one is in, in Poland. He also published the second, the third, the fourth books in Lithuanian language. So it's a very important uh, milestone uh, in cultural uh, uh, and language and religion thing that Martinus Majvidas was responsible for. Now, it sort of surprised me. I thought that I didn't know anything about this. Majvidas, Prussia, Lutherans, but he was in Verbalis, Lutheran to Proplay. Was this something that I, I found myself, or is this other people noticed this? So I looked into the Lithuanian Encyclopedia. Uh, here's a few volumes of it, published in Boston uh, in the late 50s and throughout the 60s and into the 70s. Total of 39 different volumes. And looking through it, sure enough, if you look at the volume where uh, Majvidas is written about, it mentions that he lived in, in, in Verbalis, and Getkantas is mentioned too. If you look in a separate volume under Thomas Getkantas, Verbalis, he's there too. So the historians knew about it. Look at the history of Verbalis in, a, in another volume, the 34th volume, and sure enough, it mentions Martinus Majvidas, Thomas Getkantas, his brother, Jurgis Getkantas, and also very interesting mentions that they're the brothers of uh, um, uh, of Majvidas were living there too. Now when I look over the inventory, I'm not able to identify who that would be, but it's very possibly correct that there was a, a more of extended uh, Martinus Majvidas family living there in, uh, already in 1561. And now a totally independent source is, is Bronis Kvikli's uh, four volume set, Musuliatova. It's the history of, of all the little cities and uh, towns and, uh, uh, of Lithuania, very comprehensive. Um, and in the section on Verbalis, uh, uh, he mentions that, uh, that Martinus Majus may have been tending to Lutherans there since 1557, and that he did have followers there, but he said that the number of them were not exactly known. Now, 1557 is the year that, uh, that uh, Queen Bona died, so that uh, and she was a very, very uh, strong uh, Roman Catholic, and she would have prohibited any Lutheran activities in her territory. But as soon as she died, then it sort of opened up, and Majudas may very well have moved in there in 1557, and then with the support of, of Albrecht in 1561, 
really expanded the Lutheran practice. Now, looking at the spelling in the document itself, it's very interesting how the words are presented. <clears throat> the first person who looked at this document for him, Jonas Belis at the Library of Congress, noted this ancient form of, of Polish and, and that there were a lot of misspellings taking place in, in the Polish language then. And you're thinking back almost 500 years, people weren't as literate nor as careful, and, and who would be out there in, 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 in the far distant lands you know, collecting data? It wouldn't be the most literate individuals anyway. And this shows up, let's say, in a person who is identified very clearly, unambiguously, Martinez Majvidas, a very important name then and now. His last name was consistently spelled Mosvid, and that was in, in a, a, a Polish version of it. But his first name appears in three different forms. Three different forms. Uh, it's to understand, it's an unambiguously the same person. The most dramatic thing is Thomas Getkantas. His first name appears five different ways, and his last name dramatically five different dramatic spellings. The same person, unambiguous, always identified as priest from Shirventas, and there's no other person like that. So, the, uh, and so when you look at the Propius surname spelling, you, you expect to have some wild variations. If you just look at Getkantas and what was listed here, you expect some wild variations in the Propius surname, but still would all be Proplet, would be uh, uh, all family members. And Proplis, Rimko Proplis is very clearly Proplis. Proplitis, I think, likewise is, and Proplitis likewise also. And here, the uh, part loss of land that they have right next to each other. Uh, so that that suggests a family relationship right there. And, and so that uh, I think the Proplitis, Proplitis, Papitis are all Proplis variations. Um, now, I think one reason why they may have done this, uh, volitionally actually, may be that there's another Thomas uh, Proplis. So there were two different ums with two different, that they wanted to make some differences in the spelling, two different Proplis little lineages that they wanted to identify separately so that the taxes wouldn't get mixed up. Um, uh, I, I think that makes a lot of sense if, uh, for, for that particular purpose to do this kind of, of a misrepresentation or misspelling rather. Now, I, I consulted with Zygmunt Zinkiewicz, he was the leading linguistics in Lithuania in 1978 about it, and he agreed with me that these are all Proplis variations, and he sent me the, the book uh, that I just uh, showed you, uh, in which he lists the inventory, uh, 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 birth and uh, uh, marriage inventory from uh, St. John Church in, in Vilnius, Lithuania, 1614. This is, this is now uh, 50 years later, and uh, Proplis is spelled differently, even here. But he said this is definitely the Proplis surname, and he agreed with me in terms of my interpretation. The people I asked to look at the, the uh, document and to review it, particularly with the uh, spelling of the surnames, uh, was Jonas Balis. He's a folklorist li working at the Library of Congress. Um, uh, he's published a large number of books and very knowledgeable about uh, uh, old Lithuanian languages. He agreed with me. Sigma Zinkavich, who I just so excited. My aunt, Aldona Propliene, in the Independence, Lithuania, uh, prior to World War II, she uh, graduated uh, linguistic studies, and, and, but she wasn't working at the time, but she has all the background knowledge, she agreed. Jonas Dainauskas, a historian specializing in this time period, living here in Chicago, agreed with me. And I consulted with Aurelia Tamosunaite, a linguist um, a, at the uh, uh, Vytautas Magnus University in Kaunas, who likewise agreed with my, my inferences. She's currently teaching linguistics at the uh, Gothenburg University in Sweden. So that there were eight different Proplis families in Verbalis at that time. Uh, so that means the Proplis surname had to have been uh, in existence uh, probably at least a hundred years or more uh, uh, previously. Now, the interesting thing, you have Proplis, uh, oh, I, I do want to mention one thing is that with the other variations, all the variations in this document, none of those variations appear anywhere else subsequently in history, ever. But Proplis does show up repeatedly over time. Uh, so that strongly suggests to me that these were all Proplis and, and the other variations were just simply uh, either misspellings or purposefully done variations uh, uh, on, uh, on the Proplis surname. 
Now, Martinos Majvidas from Ragaina was right next door to Jurgis Propis. There were two lots of land right next to them. Again, another lot of land right next to Rimkus Propis and the St. Helenus. Uh, so that they had lo lots of land. The most dramatic example is uh, on, the, on the city, which was called, uh, on the city street called uh, Punsko uh, Street, now Brute Avenue, where you had Proplis, Jetkantas, uh, uh, and uh, Majvidas living to all together and on the one street area, right off the market square. And I was able to identify uh, where the, uh, on the city plots were uh, on a number of the Prope residences, including uh, Jetkantas and Majvidas, where they lived, and the names of the streets. The one street that did not change uh, over time was Vesticcio Street. That's the same one now as it was then. Other streets have changed. What was Jurbarko is now Gedimenas. What was uh, Letuvio is now uh, uh, Vilnius Street. And uh, Punsko is now Beruta Street. And, 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 and I'm standing on the market square. This was the most valuable real estate in, in, in Virba. It's a high, uh, very highly taxed land um, owned by Mateus, uh, my, I mean, Jurgis Propis. Uh, he, uh, he ran a business enterprise out of this corner lot right here. Um, now, in this location where this house is, was where Mateus Propis lived. Uh, the, the current owner and resident who lives there is uh, Remas Rebkevichus. He's a very pleasant fellow. He uh, does uh, auto repair, uh, and I got to know him quite well. Across the street, this is the location where Martinez Majvidas lived. Uh, 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 and of course, this house is not Majvidas' house. That was, you know, 460 years ago. So this is the current, lo but this is the lo location of where Majvidas lived. And just to the left of the pictures, and currently just an empty area, is where Thomas Gatkantas lived. So that. The Proplé, Majvidas, and Gatkantas were intimate neighbors, very intimate neighbors. Just out of curiosity, this is a, a, the Lutheran church in Verbalis, just off the market square. But this is not from dating way back when this was built, I think, in 1833. But what's of interest to me is the foundation stones. And oftentimes the religious centers are built on top of previous religious centers. And I'm wondering whether this isn't the location of the first, first church that uh, Queen Anna built in Verbalis. I'm just sort of curious about that. And there's Proplay still living there. This is Loretta Proplis, that's her maiden name. Uh, she's lived her entire life in Verbalis. And as far as she knows and her forefathers know, they've always lived in this vicinity all the time. So she may be a direct descendant from 1561 Proplay, um, uh, living in the same geographic area. Now my roots would be just about 36 kilometers over in the Propice village, when a portion of the Propice family lineages moved over there. Now, there's some interesting uh, life kind of stories one can find in the data of this inventory, which is just sort of, ge of general interest. The population estimate of Verbatis at that time was about 4,000 people. What, uh, there were a total of seven butchers there, Thomas Propice, was one of the butchers. And to have seven butchers for a population of 4,000 sounds about correct, but nothing unusual about that. But there were 75 beer taverns, two of them owned by, uh, one by Proplé Thomas and Impus, seven mead taverns, and 31 whiskey taverns. There were a total of 113 alcohol-serving taverns. For 4,000 people to have that many alcohol-serving taverns is that where they spent all their time? And you wonder why alcoholism is a problem in current day Lithuania. Well, it certainly sounds like it was a problem in 1561. It certainly sounds like that. And uh, one can calculate with the, the, the inventory in indicates the amount of taxes that were charged on all the different land areas. Um, and the tax rates are clearly defined in the document. But to simply say the dinars and Groschen and what that meant, uh, uh, one has to convert it in some fashion into contemporary uh, currency so that it would be understandable. Uh, the, the regular farm wage a person would get for just uh, you know, doing work for a day would be about one dinar, the same amount as a soldier uh, work in the military at that time. If you use that basis of comparison, the lowest rate of payment in the United States would be the federal minimum wage of $7.25 per hour. So if you use that as the basis for comparing low-wage low workers 
you can calculate the taxes. Now, if you take all the holdings of the Prithi's family members to put them together, the annual taxes were about, were taxed about $20,000. On the 113 acres of land that they owned, it was about 13000 but for the two beer taverns, $7,000. Okay, so you could, it's stunning, you know, 131 acres of land, 13000 two beer taverns, $7,000. All the money is in alcohol. And that's what was taxed, and that's where the government weighed its money. And nothing surprising, that's just the way it is right now. If you want to have a successful restaurant, you have to have alcohol sales, and that's where the taxation takes place. Now, comparing, I was curious to compare the, 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 that, uh, the tax rate on farmland to isolated areas in the United States. If you look down the southern tip of Illinois, the area around Sherman, which is very rural, very isolated, the farmland, uh, the real estate tax, $120 per acre per year. In Virbalis, it was about $82 per acre per year, which had been a fairly isolated location uh, relative to the major cities. So that it's not that different. So that this calculation that I'm, I, I produced here for cost of things uh, is fairly appropriate, I think. So um, uh, farmland, 120 acres in Illinois currently, uh, rural areas, $82 per acre in Virbalis in 1561. Now, the amount of land holdings can be added up. And, and in the city of Virbalis, the Profis family, uh, when you add them all together, owned 8.7%, basically 9% of all the land in Virbalis owned by the Profis family members. The only person that owned more land was one person, Lord Wietrinsky, uh, owned 16%. And who he was, I could not find any information about it. And what he did with the land, uh, and what happened, I have no idea, I don't know, but he was the largest landowner. And in terms of other individuals, there was nobody comparable to Profe, because they had many different Profe's uh, family members owning land, and there were no other families, multiple families owning it. It was very unique in the number of different Profe living there. In comparison, the church rector and church owned 4.8% of the land, which is about half of what the Profe owned. Now, when Virbalis was established, uh, 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 the Bona was a very strong supporter of the Roman Catholic Church, and she made sure that the rector and the church received very generous portions of land. And uh, so that's why the, the rector had basically 5% of the land, uh, which is about half of what the Profis family members had. Now, in this document, there is no mention of the name of the priest. It's just left blank. The land is there uh, and, 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 and tax-free because it's uh, the rector and the church owned it with no name. Whereas uh, Getkantos is named as the priest, uh, uh, Majvidas is the priest, mentioned repeatedly on all the holdings. The, uh, um, the, but that suggests to me that the rector wasn't there at the time because he, he had gone. Well, if you think historically, in 1525 when Albrecht uh, be declared Prussia to be Lutheran territory, he did at the same time took away all the land and all the hold holdings by, of the church and the priests, just confiscated everything and turned it over to Lutherans. That would happen. So I suspect that when Albrecht became the de facto ruler of this territory, the rector left. And so that the only religion that was practiced in Verbalis for eight years, for those eight years, in the 1560s, was Lutherism, and that all the Prope, at that time at least, were Lutherans. Now, uh, Eugenius Ivanauskas, who is a, a noted numismatist who lives in Kaunas, uh, provided me some cost, uh, cost of items. Now, what I'll tell you now are, are, are not the prices that people living in Virbalis would have paid for anything, because uh, these were farm people. They grow their own food, they grow their own, produce their own clothing, so that these are prices that city dwellers would have to pay uh, for items that were brought into the cities. One egg, $6. One chicken, $58. A shirt, $230. A pair of shoes, $400. A sheepskin coat, $1,400. You have to be extremely wealthy to live in, uh, to be a city dweller in those days. Now, there's a twist to the story 
that was brought up by my uh, uncle Valentinus Perthius when I interviewed him in 1976. Uh, he said that uh, as a medical student uh, in Kaunas, a friend of his who was studying uh, history uh, showed him a receipt where a Pleoplis paid, paid taxes for a tavern to Vyutotas the Great, the Grand Duke of Lithuania. Now, Vyutotas the Great died in 1430, so this would have been a, a, a tax statement prior to 1430, or basically 130 years before Virbalis. And these are the notes that I have from my discussion with my uncle, uh, which I, I wrote at that time. And I never had a chance to clarify this further with him to get some more information. The, um, but the point of, this, of, his, of the notes here is that the tavern was located near Kibarte, near the Prussian border, which is exactly where Virbalis is, where the Plopis family is and all, all, all their origin is located, um, and that it was a tavern. But the thing that's unusual is that he mentioned this was a wine tavern. And wine, which simply was not popular, wasn't one of the taverns mentioned in Virba. So it really sounds a little unusual here. Well, the, the, the historical sources that I could find, got my hands on, there was not, not, nothing that I could find in reference to this. So I contacted Mr. Uh, Professor Rimbidas Petrauskas, who three years ago was the chairman of the Department of History at the University of Vilnius, who specialized in, in, in the time period of Vito uh, the Great. And I corresponded with him, uh, and he uh, looked through the historical sources that were available to him, and he couldn't find anything. On top of that, uh, he felt that those kind of receipts weren't available at that time period, that the... Um, uh, so it's unlikely that this happened, but he didn't leave, preclude the possibility. He still said there were a lot of documents that had not been fully sorted out, not fully identified, nor published. So there still is that possibility that that receipt that uh, uh, my uncle refers to exists. Uh, it's very unlikely. I think much more likely that the, the receipt dealt with the 1561 inventory uh, of Verbalis. Uh, but it's still a possibility that the Plopte had dealings with uh, Vyutotus the Great. Now, in terms of the Plipli's surname subsequent in history, as I mentioned already, there, there was a Plipli's family that moved over to Vilnius in 1614 uh, at St. John's Church in a, a birth and a marriage, uh, marriage certificate uh, uh, inventories there. 1744, the Plipli's village exists uh, near, uh, in its current location, part of uh, Pilvishke Parish. Um, now, according to recollections of, of, uh, and reminiscences of relatives, uh, Plopli actively participated in the 1863 uprising against the Tsar's government. The local center was in Antonavos, which is just two kilometers away from, from the Plopli's village, and uh, it would just take a very short walk over to be an active member on it. And during the, rev the revolt that took place in the city of Pilvishke, the uh, Tsar's uh, uh, troops came out and uh, the, the just uh, butchered everybody. There was a very in nice article reviewing it, writ written by uh, Antonio Shilinskas in the uh, uh, Lithuanian uh, newspaper Draugas in 2013. One of the leaders of the, uh, uh, the revolt was buried. Uh, Karvauskas was buried in the uh, Pliopliu cemeteries. Uh, subsequent to that revolt, for 40 years, the Tsarist government totally prohibited Lithuanian press. You couldn't publish any books, newspapers, journals, anything in Lithuanian language. You couldn't own it, you couldn't read it. All had to be Russian. But nevertheless, you, there was Prussia right nearby where the printing presses just ran and Lithuanian material was published. Plople were active in the Knigneshe, smuggling books from pr uh, uh, newspapers from Prussia and distributing them across Lithuania. So uh, active in that kind of resistance movement. The, in 1905, uh, the Plopis village, as part of the Pilvishke area, uh, demanded the Lithuanian be autonomous region, Vilnius as the capital, with freedoms of the press, speech, and assembly. Uh, the Tsarist government buildings were ransacked, pictures of the Tsar were destroyed. The Tsarist and Tsar as, as Cossack cavalry to uh, wipe everything out. So, the uh, was brutally put down. So part of the continued revolutionary trend by the Plopli continued. 1907, uh, there is in Vilnius a Plopli is looking for, for terrorist activity. 
And I strongly suspect that the terrorist activity had to do with the 1905 uh, uh, anti tsar revolt. Uh, in 1907, the Prefis village petitioned the Tsar's government to establish the Lithuanian language school. Uh, the permission was granted, but no funding was provided so that there was no, no school. In post, uh, during World War I, the front went right through the Prefis village and all the buildings were totally destroyed. Uh, uh, consequence, there were marauding thieves and murderers all over the place. My grandfather, Mateus Prefis, organized and armed the local militia, and he basically is responsible for reestablishing the, the Prefis village and protecting it. 1923, in the Prefis village, uh, inventory shows that there were 21 farms and 122 residents. I'll be mentioning a little bit of historical information about several of my blood relatives because some of the uh, information about them is quite interesting. Uh, my grandfather, Mateus Prefis, in 1900, he was drafted into the Tsar's army. Uh, he was 20 years old at the time, and he was put to be in charge of a cannon brigade. And he, in 1904 and 1905, he fought near Lake Baikal uh, in the Russo-Japanese War against the Japanese who invaded Russia. And when the front collapsed in 1905, he, along, since he was in a cannon brigade, they had horses there, and he was able to uh, uh, get on horseback, and it said that he spent about five days, day and night, just riding across all of Russia to get back to Lithuania. As far as he was concerned, he was finished with the Tsar's army. So he revolted and ran away. Now, when he established his farm uh, in, in the Prefis village, uh, he was a very good farmer. Uh, he kept uh, and maintained the best agricultural land in the entire vicinity. So multiple reminiscences of family, of many different family members said the same thing. He had 24 to 30 Dutch cows, was primarily a dairy farm. And these cows apparently were for some reason the prime dairy uh, producers in Europe at the time and grew sugar beets as his primary crop. Uh, he was the richest farmer uh, in the area, and his workers were the best paid and best taken care of by far of anybody there. Now that didn't, the fact that he was uh, uh, very good to the uh, uh, workers and, and everyone was very satisfied, anyone who came to work for him never left. They just wanted to stay forever. So the, the circumstance was so much better than anywhere else. Well, after the, 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 the communist takeover, after World War II, that didn't protect him one bit. The, uh, uh, he was slated, and his entire slated, for the first wave of deportation in 1941, which was the lethal, biggest lethal de deportation. If you were deported then, you were dead. It was a death sentence, basically. And so that the, the greed to take his land over, take it away, outdid any good that he did to the people at that time. Uh, that's just part of the communist way of life, I suppose. Now, just to digress a little bit, this is a picture of the Russian front during the Russo-Japanese War, which, uh, uh, and my grandfather, you don't see any cannons in this picture, but they were there, there someplace on the, on the front. I picked this up when I was doing my residency at the, at the Mayo Clinic at, at Flea Market in Rochester, Minnesota, and it's just so funny to see this 1905 stereoscopic picture of the uh, Tsar's army uh, where my grandfather was part of the front here. It's kind of neat to, to, to kind of see that. Well, what I was mentioning is that uh, the police family was all slated to be deported. They were on the deport list, but they were saved. What happened was this. It was because of my father. And there was a rule in place at that time that um, for the de people to be deported, if a son of yours is in the Red Army, or he's going to be drafted soon to be part of the Red Army, the family cannot be deported. Doesn't matter, they're, they're, they're protected. His age was, he was going to be inducted into the Red Army. So they avoided the uh, induction and the, 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 the deportation to Siberia in 1941. Now what's very interesting, my father being responsible, very responsible person, showed up in Pilvishke the day he was supposed to show up to be in, in taken into the Red Army. The day before, the Germans 
army started to approach Pilvishke. That day, the Russian people in the offices there with the soldiers took off and abandoned Pilvishke and, and, and retreated. So that when he showed up to, to join the Red Army, the Red Army had already had just left the day before and he didn't have to serve in the Red Army at all. Anyway, so he served during World War II as a, uh, as a policeman and a police uh, border uh, a guard. And then after the war uh, uh, in Germany, he worked uh, as a civilian volunteer for the Germans manning anti-aircraft batteries to shoot down Russian warplanes. He helped to shoot down Russian warplanes. The war was still going, still active. The war had not ended. Now, is this good or is this bad? He's helping the Germans against the Allies. But what kind of ally was Russia? Russia started the war. Okay. The uh, Ribbentrop-Molotov Pact of 1939, a secret agreement with Hitler and Stalin, started World War II. Russia was no ally. Russia was part and parcel of the Hitler problem. And I think at that time to shoot down Russian warplanes was a very honorable and the correct thing to do. And I'm very proud of my father helping out to, to shoot down what was then to be the, the, the communist plague uh, of Eastern Europe. Okay. Eventually then, uh, uh, from the, uh, uh, when the war ended, he ended up in uh, displaced person camps in uh, Germany. He worked uh, in hospitals as an orderly. But in Lithuania, he was, uh, even though he was in Germany uh, far away, he was accused of being a member of the resistance fighter. He was a partisanus. And there was a trial of him in absentia. He was declared to be an enemy of the people, and he was sentenced to death. And as far as I know, he's the only police anywhere that I could find any information of under a death sentence. So technically, if when he was alive, if you put his foot into any Soviet territory anywhere, uh, he could have been killed, executed on the spot. He was under a life a death, a death sentence. Now, just a few other people, a distant relative, Elena Proplite, uh, uh, again from the same corner of, uh, of, 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 uh, of Lithuania. Um, the, she wrote a, a, a diary, a 250-page diary of her experiences. Excerpts of it were pulled together and published by Josef Prinskis uh, in a book here. The, and in her own description of the diary, she considered this to be similar to the diary of Anne Frank and her experiences during the, during the media post-World War II area. Uh, uh, Prinskis also wrote that this reminded him very much of the diary of Anne Frank. Now, what was published is just excerpts, factual excerpts uh, of, of the 230 30 pages were published out of the total of 250 original diary pages. And all we have is one page uh, of the original uh, uh, diary. And the, poes the poetry, the human experiences, the feelings were taken out when Prinskis just simply looked at the factual information. So, uh, uh, so it really does seem that, that this was, could have been a, a, a comparable to the diary of Anne Frank. And what happened was that she ended up not in the displaced person camps in Germany like my relatives were, she ended up in communist Poland, immediately post-World War II, with four other young women. And the women were being totally terrorized by the communist liberators. Repeated rape, torture, murder, killing was what was taking place at that time. A farmer, Polish farmer, was very concerned about it and take, took the five of them in and provided for two years, protected them. And, uh, and in the barn, uh, he, he, he prepared an area uh, uh, under, the, under the roof where there was a secret entranceway that they could then climb up and they spent, the five women spent the entire day upstairs, only came downstairs when it was dark when nobody could see them for two years. And this is when she wrote her diaries. So her experience here surviving the communist plague uh, I'm sure that the, 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 the would be probably as comparable to the diary of Anne Frank. 
There's still some possibilities that we may be able to find it. My efforts a few years ago to locate it were not successful. Uh, she lived, uh, eventually ended up moving to Hamilton, Ontario, where she got married, and I was not able to find any, uh, she had any children or descendants uh, to find any further information about her. Now, uh, just a little side thing. This is Gilda Proplis in Buenos Aires, Argentina. She is from one of the Proplis families uh, that I'm related to, a distant cousin. Uh, Justinas Proplis, her grandfather, moved in 1928 uh, to Buenos Aires. And amongst the documents that she sent me uh, was this very interesting one, Antonio Balzacas. Now, Balzacas is a very important Lithuanian name in Chicago. Uh, the Balzacus Museum of Lithuanian Culture, a major cultural center. And, and Stanley Balzacus who established it, uh, uh, a very, very proud, he died a few months ago. Uh, but he's accomplished a tremendous amount for Lithuanian uh, uh, causes uh, over, over his lifetime, as did his father. So I, took, I, I, I had this image, I took it to him and asked him, and this is Stanley, a picture of him, uh, asked him what, who, could, who this could be. Is there any relation? He then looked at it, couldn't believe, wow, this is his uncle his father's brother. The only thing that was known about him is that he actually moved from Lithuania to South America. And there was absolutely no contact with Antanas afterwards. And nobody had any idea where he went or what happened to him. And so I then corresponded with Gilda and she sort of explained to me what she knew about the story. When she was a girl growing up, she met him many times, uh, Antanas Balzakas. And there was something, uh, and he was identified as the cousin of Justinas Proplis, as a blood relative of the Proplé. And there was some problem with Antanas that he was not able to live independently. Justinas took care of him, and then when Justinas died, his son Algimantas, Gilda's father, took care of him and provided for him. And that all went very, uh, very well until Antanas did some major errors uh, the house that uh, uh, Algimantas lived in was taken away as a consequence and uh, Antanas uh, uh, died tragically uh, as a consequence of that. So, but the, but the thing is that there, uh, it's very hard to imagine that you'd have a family provide lifelong care to somebody who they identified as a, as, as a relative, as a close relative, who was not a relative. So that I think that there is a close family tie between the Bonzekas lineage and the Proplis lineage, something to be uh, determined. Now, I wanted to finish up on, on some uh, legacy items of Proplé in the Chicago area. By far the biggest legacy in terms of buildings and structures is associated with Vasilovas Gutauskas, a Jesuit priest, who was my father's first cousin, so he's my uncle. Uh, he is a priest, and then in the uh, DP camps in Germany, uh, he was able, this is post-war Germany, uh, things are you know, economically extremely depressed. Uh, he was concerned about the religion up, uh, religious upkeeping of Lithuanians in, in these camps, and he was able to organize 25 week-long retreats for a total of 250 young adults uh, and paid for everything, transportation, food, accommodations, housing, everything. He was somehow, and his money did not come from the Jesuits. They did not provide it for him. He had, was always somehow able to raise the funds from the local German people living there. So he had a, a, a knack with money. So it's not surprising that when I lived in Chicago, I knew him very well, visited many times. He was the primary fundraiser to maintain the Lithuanian Center. And so I was always kind of suspicious that maybe he was able, he was the person who raised the funds to build it. And it's only been in the past two years that I've been able to collect enough data that and find out indeed that was the case. He single-handedly raised all the money to build the Lithuanian Center, the chapel, and the adjacent monastery. A total of 65,000 square feet, which opened in 1957. Now this is what the chapel and the monastery look like right now in the south side of Chicago in the Gage Park area, right off Western Avenue. And if you look just to the left, this is where you have the, the main halls, uh, the, uh, the schools for Saturday school, uh, the art gallery where there's an art exhibit of mine up right now, right in the center, up there. And um, when I found out about this two years ago that he really was responsible for building this, I, I, I joined the, uh, 
uh, the, uh, uh, the board of trustees here uh, to help out to maintain it. I'm trying the best I can to, to make sure that it continues in existence. It's a Proplis family legacy. Um, outside of Lithuania, I am certain that this is the biggest building structure Lithuania's ever built outside of Lithuania itself. So that's some legacy uh, of the Papis family to be proud of, and I'm very proud of that. Now, well, my own pride, just a little bit uh, east at the University of Chicago, just down Garfield Boulevard, just the University of Chicago, and, and where I went to school, uh, uh, two years ago I was invited to do an a installation, a newly renovated building, the Stefanovich Institute on the Formation of Knowledge, I'm standing next to McCall Sirda, who's the director of it, and Shadi Bart Zimmer, uh, to the right side of the picture, who is actually founder of it, and uh, she is the president of the, uh, she's the wife of the president of the university. Uh, and my installation is up, and it's a very, a very complex installation, filling up the uh, eight, three-story atrium. Uh, and we're here, we're installing the pieces off the ceiling, and these are rotating pieces along with the light light sculptures that were there. Uh, the atrium was produced during the renovation. This is an original building from 1893 when the university was first built, but it went to disrepair. Mr. Stefanovich gave $10 million to renovate it. As part of it, this atrium, three-story atrium was installed and my art just looked beautifully there. And there's another uh, view of the full installation. Uh, the front of the building was changed. They have a, a glass uh, uh, entrance, uh, entranceway and at nighttime, the color-changing light sculptures are, are very dramatically visible. And this overlooks the center, right of the center of the, of, of the quadrangle of the university. So a, a prime real estate on the university campus uh, during the exhibit, full exhibit here. Well, uh, when the exhibit ended about a year and a half ago, I was asked to donate these four pieces for permanent display. And, there, and of course, I agreed to it, and these pieces are on display right now. Uh, in appreciation, the university named the atrium, this three-story atrium, after me. So when you walk in there, you see my name in gigantic letters, uh, the Odus Propis Atrium. Uh, and that's going to be there uh, permanently as long as the building is in existence there. So that's my personal legacy in terms of buildings and, and structures. It doesn't compare to Vasilis Gutowska's did, but it's still uh, quite an accomplishment. Now, one of the people who came to the dedication ceremony uh, was my cousin from Rockford, Illinois. So it is Pleopli, my first cousin. Uh, and, uh, and, and just six months later, uh, he wasn't gonna be left on the, outdone by me. No, he's, he's, gonna, he's gonna catch up. Uh, and he did that and it happened. I'm, I'm just being a little facetious now. Uh, he was a teacher at Buffalo Grove High School, uh, taught science. And the, uh, he, uh, he's retired now and a number of his students were very happy with his teaching. And one fella donated a million dollars to renovate a portion of the school to establish the Solis Ploplis Automation and Manufacturing Lab, a special uh, area for science and technology to be taught to high school students under Solis's name. And this is at the opening. Uh, Stephen Yachman is the guy who donated a million dollars. He actually made all his money in hedge funds and finances. Uh, but he respected Solis so much that he wanted to have his name up in, uh, up in bright lights. Uh, so, um, so that's another uh, legacy of the Proplis family, which is quite, 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 quite a bit. The, in terms of uh, artistic legacies the, uh, and other things, if people want to look further, there's my website, proplis.com. Uh, that can uh, people look at my sister's website that I set up for her artwork, Ramute Proplis. Uh, that's available, and then a separate website for related to the people commemorating all the individuals who suffered uh, from Stalin's atrocities. Uh, so that's a separate website. Hope, hope, and spirit.